Laura. Uh, it's good to see you guys this morning, and uh, I set you up for that one. That was bad, but um, I- I'm going to give you a quote when we talk about doing what's right. Uh, by the way, Rodney, great job as usual this morning. We really appreciate all you do there. He's actually a good guy when he leaves here, too, He's, you know. Sometimes, yeah, his wife, his, by the way, though, you couldn't hear online, but his wife just said, sometimes. Uh, so I'm going to give you a quote. If you don't remember anything I say, I want you to remember this quote, okay? Obey God and leave the consequences to him. Obey God and leave the consequences to him. That's Charles Stanley, just so you know. So how many of you know what this is? I'm not sure why it's called what it's called. It doesn't really make sense. Somebody said last night it should be called an L but it's called a square, okay? Now, this was my dad's square. When he had it, it was very clean, and then his son got a hold of it, and you can see that I, didn't, I wasn't so good. But he used this when he laid block. Um, and my dad was not only a contractor, he was a really good block layer, and uh, really the best. And uh, so I can remember laying block and how we did it and what we did. The last day of my dad's life, he laid over 500 block. I was with him. I could not keep up mixing mud. Yes, we had to do it by hand because my father didn't believe in renting things. Anyway, so, um, so I was the rental. He, I had kids. What do I need to rent stuff for? Concrete pump. What do you need that for? Wheelbarrow and sun. That was me. So anyway, so uh, when we lay block, what you do, if you don't know, first they do, of course, the foundation and the floor, and then they do the corners first. And if you've ever seen somebody lay block, they, they lay the corners first on both sides. And of course, they use this to make sure everything's square. You check everything. And then they use a line with a block on it, and you put it on this side on the, on the block, and then you put it on the other side on the block you're on. And so as you lay, you can make sure, even if the the bottom is, is uneven, which, by the way, frequently happens. You can make sure it's even and even and out. But there's a problem that happens sometimes. And this happens to block layers more than it should. They accidentally put the line on the wrong block. And if they're not paying attention, they start laying and they're wondering, why does it look so out of sorts? It's because the line... Have you ever seen that happen, Carl? The, the, because they're not the, there's not always a smart... There's always one guy on the job, right? And, uh, and, and so what happens is it actually, because the line is off, the whole thing's off. So let me tell you something about your life. Your life is full of choices. So let me ask you this question. You ever have a choice that you regretted? Anybody in here have a choice they regret? Sure, right? And uh, maybe a friend you made, maybe a place that you went, maybe something you did that you wish you could undo. Um, everybody has one of those. Now, I know that, that God even uses those opportunities in our lives to change us. But the truth is, and if you're raising kids, you need to have this discussion with them. The truth is, one choice in your life can change the whole trajectory of your life. One choice that you make can lead you far away from God or lead you back to God. Just one choice. Because when you're off just a little down here, then down the road it throws things quite a bit off. But the good news is that one choice can also bring us back to God. You know, we can take a lot of steps from God, but it takes one step to go home. That's what the story of the prodigal son is. So today we're talking about doing what's right. And the truth is for all of us, we have uh, desires that often go against God's word. We have desires that often go against what God's best is for us. And we think of really bad things usually because those other people are doing those bad things. But sometimes we desire to be fearful Sometimes we desire to be angry. It's not like we want to. We just, and we give in to our anger. We give in to our flesh. We give in to those things. And so I want to encourage you today. You know, line your life. We need to line our lives up with the square of God's word. And always go back to that. Even when life gets crazy and things are uncertain. Of all the times that were uncertain, you can imagine Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, taken away from home. Uh, taken to a place they had never been with a language they never knew, exposed to all types of things they had never been exposed to. They were young, probably 13 and 14 years old, and yet they did what was right. But let me tell you some things about obeying God. So today we're going to look at three things that happen when you obey God. You remember last week we talked about chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, 
and Daniel came and interpreted the dream. And in that dream, there was this huge statue, and the head was gold, and then the rest of the statue were different things. And, and of course, you know, it was, the statue was going to be destroyed. Well, apparently Nebuchadnezzar got to thinking, because at that time he said, you know, oh, your God's the real God. But apparently in the meantime, he started thinking, you know, maybe I should be God, so I'll build a statue of myself. You talk about the most uh, uh, narcissistic thing you can do is build a statue of yourself 90 foot high, covered with gold. I mean, come on, you're a little self-centered, right? But Nebuchadnezzar had a reason to be. Why? He ruled the world at that time. He thought he was the man. And so he thought, I'm going to overcome that dream. I'm going to just build the whole thing out of gold. I guess he thought in his mind, maybe somehow he was overcoming that. But then that wasn't enough. He said, not only am I going to build this, I'm going to get everybody to quit work. We're going to have a holiday called Nebuchadnezzar Day. We're going to bring all the musicians in, play all their instruments, which is really kind of funny when you read it because they literally name the instruments in chapter 3 over and over and over. So, it, you know, Daniel's like, I'm going to just keep writing that down so everybody can know all the instruments that were there. Um, I guess, you know, maybe if they just had a name for their band, it would have been much easier. Uh, so anyway, so they name it over and over. He says, you will bow down when it happens. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego decided not to bow down. By, by the way, where in the world was Daniel? Most people think after he was promoted, he was out doing something else. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were on their own, and yet they stood. By the way, there were a lot of Jewish people in that community that had also been taken captive. But there were only three that stood up for what was right. Now, here's what happens when you obey God. It's such good news. Number one, others may attack you. Isn't that great news? You do what's right, and other people may attack you. Let me pick up the story here. At this time, verse 8, at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. By the way, another thing that narcissists love is for you to tell them how great they are or what they can do. Oh, may you live forever. By the way, I'm going to live forever. If you're a Christian, you're going to live forever, just not here, just so you know. One day you'll pray, God heal me, and he's going to give you the ultimate healing, and you're going to be in heaven, and have, you're going to wonder why your knee no longer hurts. Okay. By the way, I went hiking all week. I realized my knee hurts. Okay. May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kind of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And whoever doesn't fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But we shouldn't be done with the verses yet. I don't know. You're, you're getting ahead of me there, Cherie. Are we missing verses? Oh, you, are you wanting me to be done? So last night, literally, the guy who was doing thing got like three slides ahead of me. And I looked up, I said, are, are you ready for me to be done? And he just, yeah, yeah, pastor, I'm ready for you to be done. Okay, I get it. I'm sorry. All right. But there are some Jews who you set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Time out. When did that happen? Oh, yeah, that happened in chapter two. He put them, remember? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, kind of over these others. These guys are jealous. Now, if you don't recall, one of the things that happened in chapter 2 was, remember, the king was going to rip everybody apart uh, using trees. That's a long story that we're not going to talk about today. That's, it's very exciting. You bend the trees and tie each limb to a tree and then release the trees. It's an exciting way to go. Uh, and so that's what he was going to do. And, uh, uh, but Daniel said, king, don't kill anybody. So Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had saved these guys' lives. Now, I don't know if you've ever helped anybody. Can I tell you when you help people, they will sometimes attack you? Did you hear me? When you do something good for people, the very people that you help will sometimes be the same ones who come after you. The people whose house you bring soup to. The people who you help move furniture, I mean, there is no greater sacrifice, right? That's why pastors should never own trucks, by the way. That actually, I've had several seminary professors tell me that in seminary, don't buy a truck. I go, what? They go, you'll be moving every person in your church. 
And I'm like, I move every person in my church. Anyway, so, uh, uh, and you do things for them, you sacrifice for them, and what happens? They don't appreciate it. Let me tell you what you should do. Don't do it for them. Did you hear me? Don't do it for them. Quit helping. Oh, wait a second. No, that's not what I mean. Do it for Christ. God, I'm serving you. Jesus said, when you give a cup of cold water in my name, you're doing it for me. So when you're helping that person who literally will probably attack you at some point and be rude to you and be mean to you. I mean, I'm telling you over the years, there are people that I have helped through trials and struggles and difficulty who later told people that I never visited them. What? Well, how about these seven times? I mean, that's what I want to do, but instead I go, you know what, God? You know. I know there's a tendency when you help somebody and they hurt you to never help anybody again. Make sure you're doing it for Christ. Because He notices even when they don't. I mean, I I can imagine being Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and being like, um, King, those guys should already be dead. Can they go in the furnace too? Right? But they never say that. They never focus on that. And then the story continues. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. What are they saying? Those guys who have done all this stuff, saved our lives. You even said to worship their God. Guess what? They're not worshiping you like you said. They're, they're, they're sucking up to the king, focusing on his glory, focusing on what he's done and attacking the very people who saved their lives. When you do what's right sometimes, can I tell you what might happen? You'll suffer. Persecution. Struggle. Name-calling. So you have a choice. You can withdraw. Well, I'm not helping anymore. I used to help and nobody appreciated me. Gosh, if, if nobody appreciated you as the worst persecution you've ever had... When you get to heaven, what are you going to say to the martyrs? So what's the worst thing that happened to you on earth? Oh, I was helping at church, and this one person complained, so I quit helping. Really? My family was fed to lions. Uh, right? I mean, I mean, we have no perspective on persecution or struggle, but the truth is, if you go out of your way to bless people, it is a thankless job. Not only is it a thankless job, you'll get attacked. Hey, did you know I preach every week? I don't have to. Did you know somebody complains almost every week? I get letters, emails. Most of them are nice. Every once in a while I get a, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you said that. I had somebody write in to the church because we were doing concrete and cranes. And they said, how dare you use that as an illustration in these times when they had a collapse of a building? What? What? And then I can go get mad and, oh, I can't believe somebody. Or I can say, Lord, you know my heart. Lord, you know my heart. I could be mean. I could write a nasty letter. Or I could write back, oh, I'm sorry you got hurt. It was not my intention. In 1 Peter 2.12, it says this, live such good lives. By the way, this word in the Greek is kind of neat. It means beautiful. So let me use the word beautiful there too. I love it. Live such beautiful lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, by the way, this word accuse you of doing wrong is slander, but though they say things that aren't true about you, he never visited me. He doesn't care about me. You know what he's like? I mean, come on, you help people. That's what's going to happen to you. You give them more room to talk. Oh, well, then I'm not helping anymore. No, that's what the enemy wants you to do. You keep doing what's right. Why? They may see your good deeds. They may see your beautiful deeds And glorify who? You? God. On the day he visits us. So what's the point? To always point to him. I remember when I first became a Christian and I started doing what God wanted me to do. My best friend invited me to a party where there was going to be drinking. And I said, I'm not going to go. And my friend said, no, 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 you really need to go, man. We, we, we're going to have a great time. And I'm like, no, I, I've really, I've committed my life to Christ. And I know that's not the place I need to be. This friend that I'd had for seven years. We did everything together. Never spoke to me again. Never talked to me again. When you stand up for what's right sometimes, there are people who will reject you. But you know what you should do? Get bitter. Oh, wait, no. Be angry all the time. No. Get back at them. 
No. What should you do? God, I'm following you. Lord, I know that you'll, you know my heart. You know what I'm doing. Now, this is not an excuse for to be a jerk as a Christian. Being an example doesn't mean that you're a doofus. Some people, by the way, some of you are persecuted not because of Jesus, but because you're a jerk. Okay? So, so separate the Jesus from the jerk in you. Okay? That waitress wasn't mean to you. No, it was because you spit, you know, you yelled at her and, oh, oh I'm suffering for Jesus. No, you're not. You're suffering because you're a doofus. Right? So, so separate those two things. Understand the difference between Christian persecution and being persecuted because you're just not that smart. All right, number two. Leave the consequences to him. Remember? Obey God. Leave the consequences to him. So we got to go on a little trip, Ricky and I, and we went a little trip. We went out to Utah, and uh, it was a little dry. It was a little hot. And we... Um, I ha- we were going to take a 4x4 four four tour, but as I read by the f- about the 4x4 four four tour, everybody's talked about motion sickness. Well, I get motion sick pretty easy. So I bought a book. I mean a real book with paper. Remember paper books? I ordered a paper book, and it gave all the trails. And then I actually bought a Kindle book about the trails. And I said, okay, here's some easy trails. If I rent a Jeep instead of a car, it's the same price, then I can just rent the Jeep. When we go to Moab, I'll just do my own 4x4 four four tour. Sounded like such a good idea. And so we went up what they called an easy trail. This trail was about as wide as our soundboard. It was, imagine the size of your car plus an arm. That's the width of part of this trail. And we started on the trail, and here's a first picture here. Uh, this was actually the ending picture. Can, are you, we, can you click back to that one when I tell the rest of the story? Because I want to tell what was going on in that picture. All right, so we start up this trail, and uh, uh, it looks pretty wide here. And it was pretty wide until you got to the corner. And when you get to the corners, it's an 8,000 foot drop. So go ahead to the next picture. I think you might be able to see a little bit of the corner. So if you look, that's actually the corner that we're getting ready to go around. And you, get, you can see a little bit of the drop there. By the way, your brain does not realize that you can die with an 80 foot drop. I, I kept seeing in my head piles of Jeeps falling into the thing. Just So I'm driving and I was doing pretty good till we got to the... First curve, I thought, well, they said there were a couple of bad kerns, and so I went past the first one, went past the second one, went past the third one, went past the fourth one, and I got to the fourth one, I went, okay, they said this isn't bad, this is bad, because they got narrower and narrower. Now, Jeep drivers think they're wide. Smart people don't think this is wide. Did I say that? Did I separate Jeep drivers from smart people? Sorry, Cherie, I know your husband drives a Jeep. Don't mention this to him. All right, so, so as we're doing it, I get up there, and I, I basically start white-knuckling it. You ever white-knuckle it? Do you realize that I had a choice, but I didn't get to decide the consequences? God allows you to choose, but you don't get to choose the consequences. You can choose tonight to get drunk and drive, but you don't get to choose the consequence of whether you kill yourself and other people. You can choose not to ever buckle your seatbelt, and you may never reap the consequence, but one day you might. You get to choose what you do, but you don't get to choose the consequences. You know what our world tells us? If you feel like doing something, that makes it right. The Bible says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him, which means you don't just do what you feel like doing. You do what God's word says. By the way, we all set up idols Okay, let's, can you click back on the picture with Ricky and I? So what happened is, Ricky said, Dad, go ahead and stop. Go ahead and stop if you relax for a minute. So we got out of the truck, and I took this picture, because it was pretty wide there. I took this picture, and he looked at me, and he said, um, I'll drive. So we drove up a little farther. He found a turnaround, and he drove down the hill. I thought I was going to die in the passenger seat. Now, anybody who knows me knows, nobody drives but me. If I'm, I, I got a bus driver's license so that I could drive to camp. That's how bad it is, okay? So, so the fact that I said, okay, I'm done. I had a choice before we got on the road. Once we got on the road, guess what? No choice. I take this picture, and all I'm thinking is, I'm going to walk down this hill and leave this Jeep. <laughs> so here's what happens. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music. I mean, it was like ZZ Top times seven. 
If you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, by the way, they're called before Nebuchadnezzar, this is the king talking to them, then very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter, which I'm sure the king thought, yes, you do. No, we don't. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Doesn't that sound great? A prayer of faith. And then they say, but even if He does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods, worship the image of gold you set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into, and I'm going to talk about how that works, the blazing furnace. See, we all have idols that we set up. Some of our idols are entertainment. Some of them are security. Sometimes it has to do with our pleasures. It can be our comfort. And if we're not careful, we'll bow to those and not bow to God when life gets difficult. Now, I'm sure Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were talking to the king, thought, our God will save us. As they were being tied up, I'm sure they were thinking, our God would save us. As they are stoking the fire. By the way, back then the fire would be, it would be like a chimney. You ever seen a chimney? It's got a hole in the front and a hole in the top. And it would be next to a mountain. It would look like a giant chimney. So when they were thrown into the fire, they were thrown from the top. So you can imagine it, the guys who threw them in were big guys, probably on steroids. And as they threw them into the fire, those guys died. They were probably dehydrated from, you know, lifting weights too much or something. I don't know. But, and, and it was so hot, they died. Can you imagine Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego? They were probably like, God's going to save us as they were being carried up the hill. God's going to save us as they were being thrown in the fire. I'm sure as they were coming down into the fire, they were thinking, well, I guess God's not going to save us. The truth in life is you don't get to choose the consequences, but you get to choose being obedient or not to God. Is there any area of your life where you're saying, God, I'm going to do what I want to do and not what you want me to do? Those are the areas where you're bowing to other things. In Mark 4, 14, Jesus talks about his word and how every week as a pastor, we love this illustration because we're responsible for the seeds. But the truth is that you're responsible for the seeds you plant. And everything you do in your life is lining up the trajectory of your life. And Jesus says this, the farmer is like the person who plants God's message in people. And then he talks about the different grounds. Do you realize that you're responsible for your heart when you hear God's word? All a pastor does is throw seed. Here's what God's word said. Here's what God's word said. Some of you will leave today. You won't think a thing about what I said today. Some of you will leave today and God will use it to bring love and joy and peace. Others of you, what will happen? The worries of the world will overtake it. You'll forget it before you leave the building. We're responsible only for the seeds we plant. When you do what's right, can I tell you what you're responsible for? Doing what's right. You're not responsible for how other people respond to you. You're not responsible if somebody attacks you. You're just responsible for doing what's right. God, help me to do what's right. So others may attack you. You leave the consequences to him. And number three, this is my favorite point. His presence not only will help you, but it'll help others to believe. When I was three years old, well, I'll tell this story in a minute. A few verses later, verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar walks up to the chimney and he says, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like the son of God. By the way, most theologians think that this was the incarnation of Christ. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And then listen to this. 
The satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. And I love this scene. It's like they're checking out cattle. They're coming up to them and they're checking them out. They're looking over them. Not only are they looking over them, they're, they're smelling them. How do I know that? Listen to what happens next. They saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was, nor was a hair of their head singed, which means they checked all the hair on their head. They're looking for lice, you know? That's always a fun day. And then it says, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Listen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego suffered for their belief. You're like, well, no, no, they made it through. Listen. Being bound up is not fun. Being terrified as you're thrown into a fire is not fun. I don't know anybody who says, and by the way, the Bible in the New Testament calls God refining fire. God's refining fire in our lives. I like refiner's jacuzzi, okay? I I wish that God working in my life was just me going, oh, such a great day again. Every day is better than the last. You know, we're like the Smurfs. We just sing along. La, 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 la. Jesus loves me too. Right? And you, by the way, people who smile like this after a while as Christians, they're broken. That's what happened. They, so you, or they've had too many injections in their face. I'm not sure which is it. Right? You ever seen those people? Plastic people? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were real people. Why? Because they had been in the fire and God was with them. Have you been through the fire? Do you recognize that God is with you? When I was three years old, I went to Disney World. Three or four years old, I went to Disney World. We went into the Haunted Mansion. Don't know if you've ever been in the Haunted Mansion, but all of a sudden the walls start to expand. And when you're a three-year-old, you freak out, which is what I did. And I started screaming. And of course, my dad did what all good dads do. He picked me up, put me on his shoulder. My dad, Florida hillbilly. So he said to me, all right, son, we're going to break out of here. I'm going to go over there. We're going to step on that guy's toe, and he's going to let us out of here. And I went, okay. So my dad's smart, so he moved real slow. As it, you know, all the scary stuff happens in the room. Moved real slow, went over to the person. As he got there, I said, I said, you're going to step on his toe? Yeah, give me a second. And the doors opened. I just knew my dad had stepped on that guy's toe and got us out of that room. Right? Now listen, my dad lied to me. (laughs) Did not step on the God's toe. But God will never lie to you. And no matter what you go through, whatever the fire is, whatever the difficulty is, even if he doesn't save you from the fire, he will save you for eternity. All of us, 120 years from now, will be in heaven who are Christians. There will be one prayer where you'll say, God, heal me. And he gives you the ultimate healing. And 120 years from now, no matter how well you take care of yourself, we'll be sitting around the table in heaven going, huh, never thought, what does this button do would be my last words. Right? God has a plan for you. Now, I know some of you right now are going through the fire. Some of you are going through a hard thing. And you can decide to be bitter. You can decide to be angry. You can be frustrated. You can quit helping other people because how dare people persecute you? Some of you, the fire is from other people. For some of you, it's been from other Christians. Hey, you're not serving them anyway. Don't bow to them. Bow to God because he's with you in the fire. This is what Jesus said to his disciples. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You never know how God is going to use you even in the fire. I want to encourage you. Hey, Look at your life. Is there anything, any decision you've made where your life doesn't line up with God's word? But Eric, you don't understand. I desire this. I desire that. I desire other. We lay down our lives, the Bible says, to serve him. God, I want to do what your word says. I want to trust in you. As you do that, the Bible says he is with you. No matter what you're going through today, I hope you know God's with you. He's going to walk you through whatever the difficulty, the trial, the struggle is. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. If you're watching online, you can send me an email. If you're here today, I'd love to pray with you about what it means to surrender your life to Christ. We believe that Jesus came 
God's Son came and died for us, a perfect sacrifice for our sins, because we couldn't make it into heaven. We couldn't reach it, but all our, any good deed we did never would get us into heaven. So God sacrificed His Son so that when we trust in Him, we surrender our lives to Him. The Bible says the great exchange takes place. He takes our sins and gives us His righteousness, not because we're good enough or smart enough, but because He loves us. If you want to do that today, I'd be glad to pray with you about that. If you're here today and as a Christian, one of the things I said, or as I was talking to today, God put something on your heart and said, yeah, that's the thing. That's the area of your life that you need to repent, you need to turn from. Take some time today and just confess to God that area where you're struggling and then come back home to Him. Every choice you make makes a difference in your life and the lives of others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments. I thank you that we can obey you and leave the consequences to you. But Lord, sometimes if we're honest, we just don't want to obey. So Lord, help us to obey. And Father, give us the power through your Spirit to overcome our evil desires, our selfishness, our self-centeredness, and even the worship of ourselves sometimes. Let us lay all of those things down and worship you. Forgive us for the times we fail. Lord, thank you for these moments. Thank you that we can obey you and know that one day we will see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen.